Good morning, family. As we delve into um, our reclaiming love here in February on this last Sunday in February, um, I invite you to pray with me. Let's pray. Most holy God, we are so incredibly thankful for the gift of life. And we're thankful, God, that whatever it is that we're holding now, almighty God, whether it is pain in our bodies, whether it is stress of our minds, whether it is the weariness of our spirit, or whether it is joy and excitement, God, that you are able to hold the myriad of all the things that we experience. God, that you don't pick and choose, but that you want all of us. And so, God, we pray that you help us to bring our full selves into this moment, bring our full selves into leaning in and hearing what it is that you have to speak directly to us individually and collectively. God, that despite this pandemic, despite the restrictions of it, Almighty God, despite the fact that we must do so many things virtually, God, that your power, that your spirit is not bound by the limitations that we are bound by. And so, Almighty God, make it so that as your people heal, as you heal us, God, that we will be conduits of healing and co-laborers in the redemption of this world. God, that we will live and breathe and speak life. And so, Almighty God, we pray that we are conduits of life and healing, God, to those who are incarcerated and to their families. God, that we will be conduits of healing and life, Almighty God, to those who are stuck in human trafficking trafficking almighty God whose freedoms are bound in both body spirit and mind God that we will be conduits of healing and life to those struggling and wrestling with addiction and various forms of mental illness. God, that we will be conduits of life and healing, God, for those who need healing in their bodies, Almighty God. Lord, that we will be conduits of life and healing for those who are constantly struggling financially, God, just to have access to what they need. Almighty God, that we will be conduits of life and healing because your spirit will move through us, will work through us. So God bless the work of our hands in this world, despite the limitations that are placed beyond us, that we may trust you, God, that you are still at work in ways that we cannot imagine. And so God, we offer ourselves to you first to receive what we need, almighty God, and then in receiving what we need in this moment to be able to allow the work of our hands to bring you glory. And so God, speak that we may hear, bring us fully presence and silence any voices within us but your own, that we may love you more, that we may receive your grace more, that we may be guided by you, chart the path before us, make a way out of no way where no way is to be found. God, we thank you and we praise you that you are already doing these things. So it is and so it shall be. In your matchless name we pray. Amen. So this morning we are going to look at the reclaiming love of God. We're going to go to a passage of scripture that may be familiar for some of us. It's the gospel according to Luke chapter 8 verses 40 through 56. I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible and it reads as follows. Now when Jesus returned, the crowd welcomed him for they were all waiting for him. And just then there came a man named Jairus, a leader of the synagogue. He fell at Jesus' feet and begged him to come to his house, for he had an only daughter about 12 years old who was dying. As he went, the crowds pressed in on him, and now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years. And though she had spent all she had on physicians, no one could cure her. She came up behind him and touched the fringe of his clothes, and immediately her hemorrhage stopped. Then Jesus asked, Who touched me? And when all denied it, Peter said, Master, the crowd surround you and press in on you. But Jesus says, Someone touched me, for I felt the power had gone out from me. And when the woman saw that she could not remain hidden, she came trembling and falling down before him. She declared 
in the presence of all the people why she had touched him and how she had been immediately healed. And he said to her daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. And while he was still speaking, someone came from the leader's house to say, your daughter is dead. Do not trouble the teacher any longer. And when Jesus heard this, he replied, do not fear, only believe she will be saved. And when he came to the house, he did not allow anyone to enter with him except Peter, John and James and the child's father and mother. And they were all weeping and wailing for her. But he said, do not weep for she is not dead, but sleeping. And they all laughed at him knowing that she was dead, but he took her by the hand and called out, child, get up. And her spirit returned and she got up at once. And when he directed them to give her something to eat, her parents were astounded, but he ordered them to tell no one what had happened. So you all back in the day, Talk show hosts who found themselves desperate for ratings turn to what some may consider scandalous drama. However, what appeared to only be good old juicy fun in reality was the exploitation of deeply rooted pain. Mari Povich, Jerry Springer, and even several of the judge shows would regularly have guests who came on to sh the show for the purpose of determining the paternity of a child. And when the results were revealed, they were, there were loud boos and cheers of outrage and judgment from the audience. And though it all looked like a simple spectacle to have, um, to have these kinds of shows showing, as an adult, I found myself wondering how the child might feel if they watched their mommy and or daddy on TV fighting over whether or not they will be claimed. Situations like this often bring up questions of what's wrong with me or why am I not good enough? The experience of being told directly or indirectly that where you thought you belonged, you don't stabbed or stabs directly at our sense of self-worth and value. We all yearn from birth to be loved, cared for, to feel safe and stable, to feel supported during our most difficult moments. It is a gift all should be able to lay claim to, even though many cannot. The relationship or lack thereof between a child and their parent or parents have lifelong effects well into adulthood. And such an experience is looming, in fact, in our passage today. But I need to give a quick precursor. So the language of our account today points very clearly to the relationship between fathers and daughters. And I believe there is something quite beautiful, y'all, and gender balancing about the term girl dad that many fathers are now using. Because there has historically been a lot of conversation about the role of fathers in the lives of their sons and not so much about their role in the lives of their daughters. That is clearly at work in this passage. And perhaps we can return at another time to explore this specific dynamic. However, this sermon is intended to point us toward the role of God as not just father, but also mother, or even more broadly as parent. I've said before, but it bears repeating that I generally understand gender to be a limitation of humanity, that for all of us to be created in the image of God, that God must have both masculine, feminine, and all the in-between qualities. God transcends gender. So Jesus is identified as a man because of the body through which he entered and lived on this earth. But Jesus' actions point to the essence of a Godhead that is not bound by a gendered body. So what does that mean for us today? Simply that I will use the term parent today, not to erase the role of fathers, but to make a greater point of how God shows up in our life as both mother and father as parent. So then, 
a parent by the name of Jarius was a powerful and well-respected man. People put their trust in him and he had dedicated his life to the work of God. He was a ruler of the synagogue, but in this moment he was faced with the greatest fear of his life. His only child, his daughter of 12 years was sick to the point of near death. And he and all his social and religious power could do nothing to save her. In contrast, this woman whose name was not even worth mentioning had begun a slow death of hemorrhaging. And the same year that this parent named Jarius's daughter had begun life. In the 12 years since the girl's birth, the woman whose name was not worth mentioning spent all her money on physicians, none of whom were able to help her. She was tired and I imagine quite weak as she garnered enough hope to make her way toward a man named Jesus. The one she had heard had the power to heal. The father, the parent named Jarius makes his way to Jesus. Perhaps quite easily since those crowded around Jesus probably recognize him and based upon his status and community, I imagine the crowd parts to make room for him perhaps because they also knew that his little one has been sick. This woman, whose name was not worth mentioning, on the other hand, must push her way through the crowd, working hard to stay on her feet. She came alone, seemingly with no support nor an advocate. She had faced her worst fears years ago, but like the parent named Jarius, realizes that her only hope of healing, only hope for life is Jesus. Perhaps this woman whose name is not worth mentioning can see Jesus talking to the parent named Jarius, who is now on his knees making a plea. All propriety is null and void when your worst fears are staring you in the face and you feel helpless in stopping them. He is on his knees one minute, and shortly after, Jesus turns to follow him. No, 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 no. She presses harder, but all the bleeding has weakened her, and she falls amid the crowd as they all press to follow Jesus. On her knees, this woman whose name is not worth mentioning can see the bottom of Jesus's garment and this may be her only chance. So she reaches out and touches it. Parent, Jerry is finally having a moment of relief as Jesus begins to follow him, has that moment snatched in an instant as Jesus pauses and asks, who touched me? Really, Jesus? My baby is dying. Can we, can we please just move on? But he holds his peace. He admirably doesn't interrupt the healing of one to save his own. And yet I can almost feel his panic and apprehension, his heart beating so hard he could hear it in his ears and his breath heaving as back home his daughter's breath completely leaves her body. The woman, whose name is not worth mentioning, had not intended to actually draw attention to herself. She had what came, um, she had what she came for, but now Jesus is asking about who touched him, and she knows it's her. She knows that touch just healed her with courage. She turns back to fall before him. Jesus listens to her story and confession and then says, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. Simultaneously, the parent named Jarius is met by a member of his household with news that shatters his heart. There is no need for the teacher to come to the house. His little one is dead. But Jesus is not just a teacher. Jesus is God and he turns to address the completely vulnerable Jarius and says, do not fear, only believe she will be saved. 
He travels to their home. He creates intimate space, only allowing his closest disciples and her parents in the room. Takes her by the hand and speaks, child, get up. Life returns to her body and she arises. His first instruction is to give her what she needs most, food. There is no way to tackle the many questions or points that come up in this passage. But I do think there are a few salient points that will point us toward the ways God's love reclaims us from our places of grief, trauma, pain, and even complacency. I will not try to cover everyone's experience, but I do name in this moment that our experiences with or without our parents are complex and multifaceted. As my husband would say, I wish to hold space for you and with you as this moment becomes one of reflection for us all as sons, daughters, children of parents or a parent amid joy and grief. And we can hold all of it at once if we hold it together. So Jesus does a lot of claiming in this passage that I believe is worthy of our consideration. And so I offer these things not as a how to be or as steps towards some goal, but simply as statements that can all process um, or that we can all process and receive as we need to. All right. So first, Jesus claims through his actions that all children have access to God, our parent, without partiality. So much about this world is based upon who you are, what you have and what you can do for people. I believe one of the greatest points of brokenness and dare I say evil is the belief that some are better and therefore more important than others. Enlarged justice is often about righting this very wrong. Even on an interpersonal level, we are fickle in the way we place value on others based upon whether we like them or whether they like us, etc. For example, I can um, remember recess in the third grade and sometimes we would go outside and have free play and other times we would go outside and play team kickball. Well, for the first half of the year, our teacher would pick team captains each time we went out and they would um, take turns choosing team members. And one would think that criteria that the criteria for choosing would be based upon who was most skilled. Right. Which in this case makes sense because. um, But it still had um, challenging consequences. Right. But I noticed that we didn't just choose team members based upon skill, but also based upon who we liked or didn't like. Okay. In this particular instance, there was a trend of the same kids being chosen last. And often it was the kids with skill that were liked. And on occasion, a team captain would use their power to choose a kid that was normally chosen last before another player that was usually chosen earlier to get back at the higher ranking player for some disagreement. I mean, it was truly an intriguingly ugly lesson in socialization. We were all hoping to not be the last one chosen. And when we were last or near to last, we spent the entire game trying to prove to the others that they should have chosen us earlier. Long story short, my teacher caught on and decided near the end of the year that even um, to even out the playing field by having us count one, two, one, two, one, two to make it fair. And even then, y'all, even then we would start counting ahead down the line and try to mercilessly switch our position in line in order to get on a favorite team. Bias is strong. And this was explicit bias. We knew what we were doing. Imagine now the grip implicit or unconscious bias must have on us all. Jesus, fully human and fully divine, makes a very clear claim in regard to this. 
Jesus was claiming that he was not influenced by the biased power dynamic or partiality of society. Jarius was a highly respected leader in his community. He held clout and power within the synagogue. And remember, for most, their religion and their culture were one and the same. Jarius' daughter would have, by modern day standards, been considered a high profile patient in a hospital. But Jesus pauses in his trek to her bedside in order to attend to another who, in contrast, near, um, held nearly no status at all in society. She was a woman bleeding for 12 years, which by law rendered her unclean. And she had spent all her money trying to get better. So she was poor and she was completely alone. She wasn't even worthy of folk taking the time to learn her name. This is um, what is at the heart of the Say Her Name campaign that began several years ago, but resurfaced with the murder of Breonna Taylor. It is harder to objectify a person with a name than it is a body with no name. And here, amid the crowds, Jesus stops to attend to her, is accessible not just to the from a distance in touching his garment, but he invites her to access him face to face. However, he does the same for the daughter of Jarius. Just as he um, left the masses and crossed the sea in the storm earlier in the chapter to save one man plagued by demons, he now leaves the crowd to travel to this girl in need of his salvation. Jesus is also face to face with Jarius' daughter, holding her hand by her bedside, beckoning her to arise, inviting her to live. Jesus is not subjected to our bias and claims both publicly and privately that all, regardless of social status, have access. Second, Jesus claims through his actions that God, our parents' blessings are not scarce or in short supply. One of my aunties makes a very delicious strawberry pretzel dessert for Christmas every year. It is always a favorite and her one little small Pyrex dish that she prepares always goes home empty. Well, there was one year when I went up for dessert and it was all gone. But later I noticed that there were several plates with portions left over being thrown into the trash. I was so angry that my family members were throwing away what I saw as my portion of dessert because their eyes were bigger than their stomachs, as the elders would say. Well, the next year I decided that I was going to fill my bowl with the dessert while everyone else was in the regular food line. I covered it. I put it in the back of the fridge. And after eating, I rushed upstairs to add some more to my dessert plate. What I didn't know is that my grandma had seen me put the first bowl away. And when I came for another portion, she said, Donna, didn't I see you put yours in the refrigerator earlier? And I said, no, that's for later. This is for now. Last year, I didn't get any because people took more than their share, grandma, and then they threw the rest away. It was, it was a waste to which she said, mm-hmm. And so you're making sure someone else doesn't get their, their piece this year, right? By taking more than what's yours. What I learned, y'all, grandma in her wisdom, in that moment was that, yes, there was in this case a limited amount of this specific dessert, but that there was plenty for everyone who wanted to have some if everyone only took one portion rather than two or three. We talk about this a lot, right? Pastor Tanisha has about, talked about this. Pastor Mike has talked about this. But within fear-based culture like ours, there has been an intentional effort to teach us that there is not enough of what we need to go around. This idea often helps justify the excess of some and it supports the long-term lack and struggle of others. Scarcity mentality in this way is a lie. 
The idea that in order for me to eat or have what I need, someone else must automatically go without is not true. Though for everyone to have what they need, we may all have to change our way of life. Maybe, um, maybe that is more accurate or true. The idea that there isn't enough, though, isn't. There is often enough, even amid limitations. And when it comes to the blessings um, of God, there are more than enough. God's blessings are not in short supply. Jesus affirms this here. Stopping to heal one did not mean that the other had to go without. Parents are often astounded at how they always have more than enough room in their hearts to love more children. The same is true for all of us. Meeting a new best friend tomorrow, that mean I have to stop loving someone else in my life. Oh, I can't love you because then I'd have to stop loving my Mima, or I have to stop loving my Baba, or I have to stop lo lo loving my uncle or my auntie, or so forth. You get the point, right? God is love, and love is infinite. And God's blessings are an extension of God's infinite love, limitless, literally. Third, Jesus' claim that God, our parent, desires not only to give life, but to sustain it. Not only to give it, but sustain it. Twelve years is significant in this passage as it represents completion. And at the start of the passage, the question looming is that is does 12 represent the completion of life or does it mark the completion or the end of what is leading to death? The end of an illness. Both the woman and the young girl are giving access to life. But are they given more than that? While in college, my two roommates boiled some crab legs one weekend while I was gone. And we had one of the older style stoves, you know, the ones where the eyes would come out and there were trays underneath to catch the stuff. Well, the crab legs boiled over and made a huge mess. And they cleaned up the water that had spilled. But by Monday morning, the smell of rotten fish was so strong that we knew somewhere dirty water was still sitting from the boil over. And I asked them if they took the eye out and lifted the tray to clean the open space beneath um, the the eye to which they replied the eyes come out <laughs> once we found the source the issue was resolved even though the initial cleaning appeared to have fixed the problem it didn't jesus beckons the little girl to arise and just like that she responds and lives but then he says give her some food Jesus also issues instructions that sustain and strengthen her newly healed life. And he entrusts her to her parents who love and provide for her. Now the question is, but does he also do this with the woman who had an issue of blood? Well, in Mark's gospel, after she touches his garment or in Mark's account, after she touches his garment, and is healed, Jesus invites her forward and then says to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. Why does he make this statement when we are told she was healed the moment she touched his garment? Well, affliction can mean disease, but it can also mean the cause of a disease. Was Jesus reassuring her that the source of her illness was being healed? Was he healing the cause so that she could go in peace without fear of its return? Consider this. There are scholars that believe that the source of her illness was due to social and cultural stress, that isolation from family, living as a woman in a paternal culture, clearly without a father or a brother specifically or other male um, relative to provide for her to advocate as Jarius had for his daughter. They believe that the emotional stress had to be released physically somehow. And so it was released through the constant flow of her blood. 
Dr. Nadine Burke Harris, I've mentioned her book before, The Deep as Well, explains in detail in her book just how much childhood adversity in particular impacts our stress response system and elevates our likelihood of chronic illness in adulthood. All of her work is quite profound and I highly recommend the book. But what if Jesus is speaking to this reality in her life? What if he not only is giving life, but is sustaining it? Consider this. Jesus calls her daughter, which may not seem odd, except he does not do so directly in any other passage in scripture except with her. He refers to the woman with the infirm spirit as a daughter of Abraham, which is contextually important within that text. But I cannot find another passage where Jesus directly claims another as daughter. Consider how many times Jesus refers to his father in heaven, but here he literally assumes the role of parent, of father, of mother, or for our purposes more broadly the parent. He claims her. And I am suggesting that in doing so, he is jumpstarting the healing of years of abandonment, years of loneliness, years of poverty that are all directly connected to a disconnect with parental figures in her life. Jesus, in this one claim, says to her, you belong with me. And in fact, Jesus would understand how important this is. He who was claimed and raised by a parent who was not his biological parent, Joseph, who trusted God and did not walk away when he discovered that his fiance was impregnated by someone other than him, by the Holy Spirit, but still it wasn't him. And here is the crux. To be reclaimed by the love of God, to belong, is directly connected to our sense of identity and self-worth. Are we good enough to be loved no matter what? Yes. God's love for us does not change and neither does our worth. But whether or not we can live within that reality, whether or not we can believe it, doesn't simply impact our quality of life, but it dictates our actions. A rightful sense of self-worth and identity can mean the difference between whether or not we keep pressing or whether we give up. It can mean the difference between whether I press to achieve my dreams or not, whether I fight for justice or not, whether I reach for peace or settle for chaos. It can mean the difference between being filled with life or always feeling as if we are dying. Jesus claims her. One of the definitions of claim is to demand or a demand for what is rightfully one's own. Jesus claims her. And in doing so, he was demanding that she embody what was already rightfully hers, an immeasurable amount of value and worth, a sense the young girl was more than likely already to have based upon her family support as evidenced specifically by her father's willingness to release pride and publicly beg his, for his daughter's salvation regardless of his position in society. By claiming this woman whose name wasn't even worth mentioning, Jesus was saying, my love for you makes you worthy. Jesus claims her when others had not. Jesus claims you and Jesus claims me. And that means no matter what, we all belong with God. No matter what this world has dealt you, the love of God desires you and will endlessly reclaim you over and over and over and over again until you realize that in reality there has never been a time when God has disowned you. You and I have always, always belonged with God and we always will. So let the love of God 
reclaim you today, family. In the name of all that is good and right, in the name of love, amen.